So our next uh, presentation is on Fraud Prevention 101. Uh, and I wanted to introduce uh, Sarah Shipley uh, quickly. Uh, when I knew that Sarah Shipley is going to be a part of this, I thought my job is so much done. Because she's, she's again is one of those um, uh, wonderful, she met with us um, be, even before this. She, uh, I have been told to stand over here because I've been telling, telling people where to sit and then I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, she came and talked to our business science and technology about her department um, and uh, she is a consumer protection attorney with the Northwest Regional Office and the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and she, uh, she tells me this and I of course remember she, she volunteers for the um, homework help uh, at the Columbus City Branch Library. And this is one of the programs. Oh, and, and, and we depend on people like her at, at the library. You know, the kids come in and this is who they need to see to, to get their homework done and get back to school and, and, and feel great about what, what they've done. Um, so prior to her joining the FTC, she worked for the Consumer Protection Division of Washington State with the focus of charitable solicitation and charitable asset protection cases. Um, I think I'll let her tell you about her college because uh, after my brain is full of acronyms, I can't tell you <laughs> other than CFPB. So I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you all for being here. Great. Thank you all for being here. Um, can you hear me all right? Thank you all for being here and for coming on this wonderful program. I hope that we have some valuable information that you're able to take back to your branches and share with the I'm going to go ahead and introduce the other panelists. Um, and then we each have, have about 10 minutes to present, and then I'll have some questions for the panelists. We will put up uh, for questions from the audience. So directly uh, to my left is uh, Dorothy Kim, who's a sergeant in the Seattle Police Department Elder Crimes Unit. Sergeant Kim began her career with SPD 23 years ago and has served on the mountain bike squad. Oh, I was 12 years old. <laughs> just, a, just a baby. I'm your baby. Uh, and she's also been on the community police team. In her current position, uh, she supervises three detectives that investigate crimes against vulnerable adults. Uh, the vast majority of the unit's case yeah, involved financial yeah. exploitation. Uh, Sergeant <laughs> Kim also <laughs> teaches at the Washington State <laughs> Basic Law Enforcement Academy in the subject of elder crimes investigation. Cool. Yeah. And then to Sergeant Kim's left is Lynn Peters, who's the Director of Communications, Financial Education and Outreach with the Washington State Department of Financial Institutions. Lynn worked with the, has worked with DFI since 2007. She's passionate about educating Washingtonians on various financial topics, including understanding credit and how to use it wisely. Uh, she, has, she received her BA in news writing and photography, which she applied in her previous life as a newspaper reporter and editor. So very, uh, very honored to be on this panel with these two esteemed colleagues. And I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, walk through my presentation now. So uh, I work at the Federal Trade Commission. We have a Northwest Regional Office here in Seattle. I'll tell you a little bit about the FTC. Uh, we're a consumer protection agency um, that works to protect consumers from fraud, deception, and unfair commercial practices. We're a relatively small federal agency. Uh, most of our staff is in DC, but we have seven regional offices. The Seattle office covers the Northwest region, and you can see that in the upper left-hand corner of that uh, map. So the uh, one primary function of the FTC is law enforcement. Uh, consumers report scams directly to us. Other agencies uh, share their reports, including uh, the Washington State Attorney General's Office and the BBB. Then we investigate and we bring cases, again, not on behalf of individual consumers, but um, general cases that do end up uh, seeking consumer redress. We also offer a lot of consumer education. Um, Many, many resources are available for all sorts of different types of fraud prevention and also resources targeted at specific types of populations and many non-English resources as well. The types of complaints that we're hearing about are a little bit different than the types of the complaints that the AG's office are getting. Uh, you can see that the largest types of complaints we get are about debt collection and an increasing type of complaint that we're getting are imposter scams. And we're seeing these more and more frequently. Uh, we also get a lot of complaints about ID theft. Um, this pie chart doesn't include do not call complaints. Uh, our office also takes complaints uh, for violations of the do not call registry and do not call laws. 
and those always, we get a lot of those. People are very upset um, about violations that do not call law. So I wanted to talk about three types of scams that we're seeing a lot, uh, a lot of these days, um, and just give you a little bit of background about them, how you can spot them, and then if somebody does come to you, um, what 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 information you could give somebody about maybe how to react if, if they do think that they might be approached about a scam. So the first is an imposter scam. What is an imposter scam? An imposter scam is whenever somebody pretends to be somebody that they're not in order to try to get money from a consumer. And that can take a lot of different forms. Uh, we've seen it where people call and say, you owe money unless you pay, you're going to get deported. Work from tech support, there's a problem with your computer, I need to get access from it or you need to pay. Um, somebody calling to pretend to be a friend of a relative or a relative saying, I'm in jail in Mexico, I need bail money. Um, you've won, all you need to do is pay this $25 service fee or these taxes and you're going to get this huge payout on the sweepstakes. Uh, congratulations, we've got a government grant or you owed money um, from the government. And actually something that we're seeing uh, become more common is, hi, I'm calling from the Tr Federal Trade Commission and we're working on behalf of you to get you some money back. <laughs> so um, there are even imposters out there that pose as uh, Federal Trade Commission employees. Yeah. We're dealing with one right now where a consumer lost nearly $200,000 on behalf of that. So it's not unheard of. Um, more imposter scam complaints in 2016 than ever before. Signs of a scam are the way that the scammer is gonna to try to get them the payment. So you need to wire money right away. Or go pre buy some prepaid debit cards and send those to us. Um, or you need to confirm this personal information right away over the phone. We need your social security number, we need your account number. Or we need access to your home computer right away, so if you can just give me access to that. So what you're gonna tell somebody is um, don't wire money. Don't, you should never have to pay money to get money. So if you're saying that you're owed, but you just need to pay this money, that's normally a sign of a scam. You shouldn't have to pay money to get money. Um, don't give out your financial or personal information. Um, and one other thing, just kind of, if, if the person is on the do not call registry and they get a call on their home phone from somebody who would otherwise be blocked, there's a good chance that that person might not, it's, it's a good, red flag because very legitimate businesses are going to actually abide by do not call registry laws and not be calling people that are on the registry. Uh, so another type of scam that we see are work at home scams and these are where people will contact either by phone, by email, or will otherwise uh, have marketing materials out there telling people well, you can make a lot of money just working from home. Um, and. It, there's always going to be an upfront fee to this. So we have these trainers available. We're going to teach you how to do this. You just have to buy into our program or pay for these types of service. Uh, really common one is that you can start your own internet business at home and earn thousands of dollars a month. You don't need any experience. You'll hear we've got coaches. Um, and if a patron comes to you and has questions about like, oh, I, you know, I hear I'm thinking about doing this, there's some homework that they can do. There's actually a federal rule uh, an administrative rule, an FTC business opportunity rule that entitles people to a certain basic information. So there's some questions that patrons should be asking. Uh, will I be paid a salary? Will it be commission? Who will pay me? When am I gonna get my first paycheck? What's the total cost of the program? And once they start asking these questions, they're gonna find out really quickly whether this is legitimate because there's gonna be you know, helpful answers to this or it's gonna feel a little bit squishy. Um, they can also, another good thing is just go on Google, enter the company's name along with words like complaint, review, <laughs> scam, and there's gonna be forums uh, or reader boards where you're gonna find out really quickly whether other people have had problems. I know that there's gonna be more discussion about student uh, debt issues later in the afternoon, but um, <coughs> this is also a really serious uh, area for fraud. Uh, students may get a call or an email by, uh, from somebody who's promising that they can lower payments or eliminate debt. A lot of times these scammers, this is kind of like a hybrid imposter scam, so you're gonna, they're gonna use a seal or a name or a logo that makes them look like maybe they're, um, they, they are uh, legitimate or have some sort of government affiliation. 
Um, they might also tell the, the person that they have special access to certain repayment plans, new federal loan consolidation options, loan forgiveness programs. Uh, again, in these sorts of situations, if, if there's going to be an upfront fee, that's probably not a good sign. Um, it's good to remember that nobody can promise anybody total loan forgiveness. So if the promise is like, we're going to wipe it all away, that's a good red flag. Um, and only a scammer is going to tell somebody to just stop paying their loans. Right now. So if, if, the, if the student is told, you don't just stop paying right now, we're going to take care of this, we're going to reconsolidate, we're going to get you some loan forgiveness, that's a, a really good sign that it's a scam. And if the student does actually stop paying, that can have really severe consequences for them. Uh, their loan balance could balloon because of interest, it could damage their credit. Scammers will also want to try to create this sense of emergency, like, you know, you got to get under the wire for this new federal program, so you need to act quickly. Um, people should never act quickly when they're making these types of sorts of decisions or uh, looking into consolidation. Uh, the studentaid.gov has some great information for people if they have uh, federal loans, and there's, the AG's office actually has great resources for students. Um, so. Just if you go on the Washington State Attorney General's website, they created a wonderful handbook that has a lot of information. Uh, I want to just introduce you quickly to a couple of resources, um, and these are all in the PowerPoint slides, so I'll run through these really quickly. There's a number of different places um, that we really ask people to file complaints because this is how we monitor what's going on. This is the way we find out about scams. Uh, you can file a complaint online with us, you can file a complaint online with the CFPB, and the Washington State Attorney's Attorney General's Office, you can file a complaint online and you can call. And again, like what Travis was talking about, there's that informal mediation process that the AG's office also offers to any consumers in Washington State. Um, our website has a bunch of different information, uh, scam alerts, uh, reporting identity theft, how to get your free credit report, registering for the do not call list. And this is the big plug for you guys. Is that there's actually a specific page for librarians with resources that are directed just for librarians. Um, a bunch of different information that you would find particularly uh, inter interesting. And then also a way to order resources for free. So you can go to our bulk order website and you can order any of our materials, and there's tons, and they're in different languages, and they're for different age groups, um, and they're completely free. So uh, if, if you're interested, if you see a need within your, the, your patrons, um, you can go on our bulk order website and order as many as you want. All right, um, so <coughs> ran through that pretty quickly. Um, I want to turn it over now to Lynn. Thank you everyone for being here today. This is a great turnout. This is a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be, so yay you. Um, so my name is Lynn Peters. I'm the Director of Communications, Financial Education and Outreach with the Department of Financial Institutions. Yes, that does fit on a business card. Um, we are a small state agency. We license and regulate financial institutions throughout the state, so like your local banks and credit unions, payday lenders, mortgage brokers, money transmitters, check cashers, if it has to do with money, we're probably licensing and regulating it. In addition to financial planners, financial advisors, some securities, um, we are now also licensing Bitcoin, things like that. So a little bit of everything. The four main things we do is license, regulate, educate, and protect. Um, I'm in the educate and protect category because my job is to go out and talk to people about financial education. So some of you, I might have been in your libraries, especially during Money Smart Week or Financial Capability Month. We do presentations on the road. Um, we don't give advice, but we, we provide information. Um, in the back of the room is a very small sampling of my resources. It's because yesterday's um, event sort of wiped me out. and <laughs> That's what was left in the car. Um, <laughs> and some FTC things as well. It's nice. I said, don't pack that. I'll take it with you. Um, 
we are a small organization. Like I said, there's only three of us in the communications department, and um, one of them is a web guy who doesn't go out with us a whole lot, and three part-time people who come with us. So the power of partnership is so important for us. Um, most of the folks in this room, CFPB, um, Alice from the Financial Empowerment Network, we work with them. Um, we also work with a group called the F Consumer Protection Washington. It includes Better Business Bureau, Attorney General's Office, FTC, UTC, IRS, LNI, Northwest Justice Project, OIC, uh, Office of the Insurance Commissioner. I get full of these acronyms. Um, Seattle Office of Cable Communications and the Secretary of State. So there's a group of us all focused on consumer protection. There's a website that's um, housed within DFI's website. You just go type in Consumer Protection Washington on our website and it'll bring it up. You can request presentations from members of these groups on a variety of topics. Um, I work with a financial education public-private partnership that does teacher and librarian trainings about financial education, especially for youth, K through 12. Uh, Jumpstart Washington, Bank on Washington, um, various asset building coalitions throughout the counties, CFPB, FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, um, and AERP. So those, those are our big partners that we work with because we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, in 2008, we were tasked with doing financial education for all residents of all ages throughout the entire state. It was like, well, that's called job security. <laughs> awesome, I'm glad I have little miles on my car. <laughs> um, so we do take a lot of complaints. We have five divisions within our agency, four that are the ones who are handling the money. So we have consumer services, securities, those are the ones that are gonna see most of your clients. Banks and credit unions, most of our local banks and credit unions, we don't have a lot of complaints with. Um, it's pretty rare. It's usually the big guys and those get sent off to Office of Thrift Supervision, things like that. Um, but ours here in securities, you'll, you'll see some unlicensed and unregistered is sort of a, a common theme here. What we tell people is make sure that you're working with a licensed professional. If they don't have a license, there's no security, there's no protection for people. So um, I'll start with the security side. Unlicensed and un, un, um, registered products and unlicensed salespeople. So when they have a product that's not licensed and the person isn't licensed, there's not a lot of recourse if they've sold you something and then gone and bought their house or gone on a, the worst is when these people go take trips with their families because then there's nothing for us to sell to get your money back. It's a lot better if we catch it in advance. So if you have a, a patron who comes in and says, hey, I'm looking at buying this investment, somebody told me this is a really great deal, it's you know, no risk and 25% returns, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Say, let's go look up these people in DFI and see if they're licensed and see if their product is licensed. And if it doesn't pop up in that licensee database, let's give them a call and find out just to make sure so you don't lose your money. Um, promissory notes, um, those are typically done with folks who are um, a little more savvy about investing, but when you get a scammer, they're coming after people because they, they come with higher interest returns. And in the, the era of, we have what, 0 0.05 interest on our savings accounts these days, a lot of people are wanting to get a little bit more, and they're kind of falling for these things. Oil and gas investments, this thing never leaves the scam list, I swear. One would think eventually it would go away, but it doesn't. One of the things that they'll have is they'll have the company that is calling you is not in the state, the company where it's located is not in the state, so you can't, and they may be in different states, so you can't go drive by the place to see are there actual oil, are there, is there actually manufacturing quite on in this place, what's happening here, or is it just an empty lot, is it a parking lot? Um, real estate investments, we see a lot of that, although not as much as we had in the past, but it's coming back up on the uptick again. And Ponzi schemes, you know, the I'm going to take your money, the people at the top are getting money paid by the people down at the bottom, and that whole thing collapses as soon as somebody doesn't pay anymore, and then the people at the top are like, where's my money? Anybody remember Madoff? Mm -hmm. That was a great one. Um, consumer services, loan collection scams, we get the phone calls. You owe us money on this payday loan. They may not have ever taken it out or they might have already paid it off. Um, advanced fee scams where they call you and say you need to pay us up front for a loan. Um, what was interesting about the student loans, those are coming in email, they are coming in text messages, they are coming in the mail. So if you, if you are working with people who have student loans, 
tell them to be very, very wary. Tribal lending, um, because some of these organizations are not licensed in Washington State, and then you may get sucked into a really high interest rate. Um, we actually filed a lawsuit against one, and then it went national. Um, and a lot of people lost a lot of money. Reverse mortgages is another thing that we're seeing a lot of. I get more calls from people about this now. My apologies, week three of bronchitis. So if I start to choke and run for the door, you'll know what happened. <laughs> but there's a lot of ways to, to tackle this based on our website. So does this have a little pointer thingy? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Look for the alerts. We're going to post consumer alerts on a daily basis. A lot of what we see now is the unlicensed payday loans. We're going to put a place right here. Click on that to file a complaint. If you think you're working with somebody who's unlicensed, if you think somebody's been taking advantage of you or a patron, file a complaint. Um, I live by the rule, sort of like TSA. If you see something, say something. Um, you guys are oftentimes the front line. You might have somebody who comes in and says, hey, can you help me with this? I, I, I've won the lottery, but I need help entering my information. We want you to be aware of these things. Um, and then also, you can see what enforcement actions we've taken. We post everything online, it's up there forever, much to the dismay of people who have done bad things. They call us on a regular basis, I did my time, take it down. No, you also did the crime. <coughs> Pardon me. Here it comes. <coughs> okay, so I'm gonna leave it at that, and I'm gonna go run outside real quick, and I'll be right back. <laughs> So I'm um, Sergeant Dorothy Kim with the Seattle Police Department. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, it feels uncomfortable for me to sit because I normally stand when I talk, so I'll try to muddle my way through this. Um, so I've been with the department for 23 years, and the vast majority of my time is actually spent in patrol. When I got promoted, um, I went to become a patrol supervisor as well, um, and then ended up in the domestic violence unit supervising the the. <laughs> Great. We want her to be comfortable. Yes. Um, and so I started supervising the three detectives that investigate um, crimes against elders. And so it was really interesting being in between these two guys um, as they are more pro, uh, proactive and being preventive to crimes against uh, not necessarily el elders, but all people that can be impacted by fraud crimes. So we actually are more reactive, and it's after people have been victimized that we start these investigations. Um, part of our unit, though, does go out to nursing homes and community centers and you know, try to do some of the same work that they do. And in fact, when I was uh, preparing for today, I went to get our stacks of um, information and booklets that we normally hand out at those presentations, and all of them were from the FTC, so, and AARP. So I didn't bother bringing them because I figured she would be bringing some. And, and, and now looking at their website, you guys Okay. Um, uh, and the, their website is great, and we actually refer a lot of people to their website to file complaints because even um, if an elder has been victimized on some of the scams, we, our elder detectives, can investigate investigate them because oftentimes this unknown suspect, the suspect is out of state, there's multiple jurisdictions involved, and so we, um, we don't concentrate on those crimes, but we do encourage people to go to the FTC website and launch their complaint there. So um, I have three detectives, and the vast majority of our cases that we investigate are uh, neglect and financial exploitation. And really it's financial exploitation coupled with neglect. Um, so the vast majority of our cases, even if there's uh, financial exploitation, there will also be neglect involved and, and most likely by a family member. So, um, so those are the vast majority of cases that we investigate. Um, I teach at the academy and I actually, um, when I teach at the academy, I, I tell the new recruits, I'm like, I actually don't understand why people even commit robberies anymore. Because really, if, if you really want to get the most bang for your buck with the least amount of risk, it's really to identify a senior. A mm -hmm. uh, lonely senior who has the, the beginning of dementia, uh, it's really right pickings for them and very low chance of getting caught, <coughs> right? Um, when I first came to the unit, one of our first cases was 
this elderly woman in her 90s, always lived on her own, unmarried, un no kids, took care of her parents, worked her whole life for the city of Seattle, was living on a pension, very frugal. She had saved every dime. You go through her bank records every month. It was rent payment, food, light bill, whatever. You know, So she was spending like $800 a month. She had got a caregiver off of Craigslist. Within one month, $200,000 gone. Where, because once you let somebody into your home, what do you have in your home? Driver's license, social security cards, checkbooks, credit cards, you know. And, you know, for us, what we find is that, you know, often seniors are from the era where they have perfect credit. So if someone steals their identity or uses their social security number, you're getting a credit card with a $50,000 limit, right? And, you know, and that's, you know, the you know, seniors, you know, are, and may not even know about it. Um, sorry, where was I going with that? Anyways, uh, so that's what I, you know, I was trying to think about what the librarians can kind of be on the lookout for. And I, I would say that a lot, of, a lot more seniors are starting to use the library for computers now than, you know, what, even five years ago. And that, that is something that I would be on the, the lookout for is a senior in there, especially if they appear to not have family and local resources being victimized or being targeted by other uh, people that are coming into the library, or if you haven't seen that senior come in to the library and now all of a sudden another person's coming in with them and maybe sitting at the computer with them and it looks like financial information is being exchanged, um, that would be something to look for. Um, yeah, uh, I guess that's about it. Um, I'm open for, um, oh, yeah. <coughs> You know, and that's a difficult question because often even with us in, in doing investigations is until you are diagnosed with dementia, there's a good chance that you are able to make bad decisions. You're able to make bad We all have made bad financial decisions, right? And we don't have dementia. Uh, and so it is, it's a fine line. Um, yeah, I mean, I would get local law enforcement and then also even go to their website and make a complaint. I think you can do that even <coughs> without you being the victim, because then it's on their radar. And I could be wrong, but I... Yeah, that's what it, so, it just wasn't... That, that was one thing I was on. Yeah. Can you summarize that for the audio, by the way, and people in the back? Can you repeat the question? Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Her question concerns... Sorry. someone. That's okay. Someone coming into the library and... Uh, appearing to try, needing assistance for wire transfers, and it, it raised a lot of red flags, and she was asking about kind of the fine line about trying to convince somebody not to do it, and you know, what kind of some of the moral obligation is, and you know, legal obligations. Um, I, you know, I, I would probably have asked about family, and if there's any family we can help, con you know, it's hard for me because you guys are, you know, like as police, you know, I would say, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, where's your family? Let's, you know, try to contact them. And I, I'm not sure exactly what your role is as a librarian, if, if you would be that forceful, like, you know, like I would be. So um, you can also look up on the alerts pages with the FTC and DFI, you know, are, are there outstanding alerts for these companies? Are these companies known? as you know bad actors and share that information with that person to say hey you know I know that these are opt-in scams let's look it up real quick yeah. and I'll just say that one of one of the easiest things that you can do when, when you th when somebody might potentially um, be a victim of a scam is just to have a conversation with one other person so it's the conversation with you that might have started to have somebody uh, start questioning what's going on it can be a conversation with a family yeah. member or a friend this person had told the, the other woman don't tell anyone about our interaction. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty common. If yeah. told any other family member, she just revealed it to 
the library staff worker who you know, was trying to help her write these funds. It was just a. <laughs> yeah. And our office is also taking calls from folks where, you know, they have a concern because they see something going on with, with their, uh, an older parent or an older friend or relative, and having that person talk with somebody from our office who can just, again, be that kind of neutral third-party voice to be like, wait a second, let me ask you some questions, let me give you some education. That can be enough to just stop it right in its tracks. Yeah. Um, and just also to really quickly introduce uh, Nikki Fertel. She's one of the detectives that does elder crimes. And so she'll be chiming in a little bit because um, she actually does the investigations. And I think she might have had a comment already. So I have a case right now involving an elder who went to his local 7-Eleven and attempted to um, buy $2,500 worth of gift cards that he was going to be sending to a friend. Um, the clerk was really alarmed by this and, and believed that he might be the victim of some sort of exploitation. So what he did is, oh, gee, you know, I'm having a problem with the machine right now, and sort of put the guy on pause, got on the phone with 911 and said, I've got someone in front of me, I think he's being exploited, can patrol come and talk to him? The officer was able to come and, and at least make contact with the gentleman get a name, get an address, phone number, he wrote up a report that came to me. The elder is not interested, uh, at that time he was not interested in speaking with the officer about any details, because I think he'd been warned not to provide details. Um, he has a five-year history of financial exploitation by different entities. I don't know if you've ever, ever heard this said about mental illness, the greatest likelihood of someone being hospitalized is prior hospitalization. Same thing for financial exploitation. You are much more at risk for being financially exploited if you've been exploited in the past, and this guy has. Um, you know, at this point, we're working with the Adult Protective Service to get him stabilized and, and protected so that he doesn't continue to be victimized by what's going on. That is the other big thing here making the police report, so hopefully you have a detective assigned who can look into the matter, um, but also making the referral to the Adult Protective Service so that they can make an assertion. Is this individual vulnerable? Um, and, and what steps can we take to maybe protect them in the future going forward? Um, one of the things that we can do is grab bank records and take a look at, you know, how long has the hemorrhage been going on? We can research family members in the area who might be willing to assist. Um, so your initial contact and maybe calling in the, the uh, um, backup, calling in backup, um, law enforcement, might be enough to get the ball started and, and getting those other stabilizing things in place. And we've got some flyers in the back that have that Adult Protective Services number. There's the Senior Safe Flyer and the Elder Fraud Prevention Flyer back there as well. And uh, that's where we get the vast majority of our co complaints and our investigations are from Adult Protective Services. And a lot of them are now starting to come from the banks themselves because the banks will have a fraud unit that identifies some sus suspicious behavior. And like my woman that had lost $200,000 in one year, the bank was the one that actually brought it to our attention because she had years and years and years of very consistent spending and the spending changed. Okay. Uh, so do we have any education for these people? Uh, you know, make people aware? So the question is, do we have any education for these people? And I think um, a lot of the flyers and the handouts that the FTC and DFI, DFI um, have really address it really uh, very succinctly. Um, also AARP, they have great websites and great um, handouts as well. And those are all the stuff that we provide when we present to the community centers or to senior centers. And the, so. the Federal Trade Commission actually has an entire outreach campaign called Pass It On, which is geared toward older adults. And um, a lot of times, I think that other people have probably seen this, where sometimes having a young person come and be like, just, 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 you know, we're going to tell you what to do, and we're going to tell, you know, don't do this, don't do that, isn't the best way to communicate with somebody uh, intergenerationally. So I've passed around with everybody's folders. There's a sample of the Pass It On materials that we have that are geared towards older adults and describe some of the most common types of scams that are hitting older adults and, and, and are presented in a way that, that doesn't run into that sometimes sticky situation of intergenerational communication. Okay. Um, 
And that's one of the reasons why we partner with AERP, because my other counterpart is 23. Yeah. <laughs> but so, and they can, and they have mailing lists like you wouldn't believe. If you want to get a big crowd of people into your library, work with AARP and have them come. And at least my experience with AARP is they're staffed with older adults to begin mm -hmm. with, so much more in tune with, with the population that they're identifying. In our office at uh, CFPB, we have an office for older Americans. And we, if you see these things, um, encourage folks to file the complaint with us. Sarah put up there, you can do it on our website. We also have an 800 number that you can call. And we take complaints in 180 different languages. So if you have someone there who does not speak English, you can call us uh, or send them through the email and we can take that complaint. We also keep a database of all of their complaints that we receive that you can access that we do share with DFI and the Federal Trade Commission. The more that these guys know of what's going on, the more information that is out there, the more that you can, have, more that they can be effective in trying to prosecute some of these criminals that are doing this. Um, the other thing I know is this is about the 20th of these meetings that we've pulled together here at the CFPB. Um, this is always the most asked for topic. You all are on the front lines, and we hear this a lot. And I have heard so many sob stories. When we were down in Eugene, there was a senior who was lonely, and he made a friend overseas, and the man had a total of $500,000 over a three-year period sent to his friend overseas. And so they need to know what's going on, and the Adult Protective Services are another great place to refer, to let them know what is going on to finally try to get into the senior to help them out. But loneliness, in addition to dementia, is another very huge component here. And I know that you'll probably get a lot of seniors coming into your libraries that may be lonely, and they're just looking for someone to talk to, or some kind of social interactions. Um, the areas for aging, um, areas off the... Officer, area offices for aging. The, uh, the area offices for aging, I can't remember the acronym is another group that here, they're all across the country, another great group for you all to work with to try to find some way to socialize and help these seniors. Yeah. One, and, of the, sorry, sorry. one of the biggest things that I, I will kind of forewarn you about is one of the way, the, the best way to have an outcome that works is document, document, document. So we'll need to know what was the website they were trying to go to, what was the name of the person they were trying to talk to, how much was the money? Had they be, did they get anything in email? Did they get anything in the mail? Did they get a phone number? As much information as possible that you can share with our organizations, that's going to help build a better case. And it, reporting to law enforcement as well, because especially if it's going to be a family member or someone that is known in the community, they're going to continue to victimize other people, and we, it's really important for us to know about it. And, um, and it can be difficult. I mean, I, I know... A lot of the people we work with as a senior, they're, especially once they realize they've been scammed, they're embarrassed because you know, they're you know, 70 years old, 80 years old, and they've managed to live their whole life you know, taking care of themselves. And this could be kind of the first step where they start learning, uh, you know, I am starting to need more help. Um, well, there's been big cases about it. Mickey Rooney was victimized by his children. Ann Rule, Ann Rule yeah. was victimized by her children. And they, for years, they didn't say anything. And you know, Mickey Rooney died with not a whole lot of money because his kids took everything from him. And, oh, oh um, does the CFPB or DFI offer programs to where you know um, we have a branch in SWIM, which is a really huge retirement community? Mm -hmm. And we've been out there a few times. <laughs> some feedback that I've gotten from our SWIM patrons is um, they don't trust the ARB because they get the sense that they're. Promoting and selling something. Yeah. Um, so we I come do workshops. We come do presentations. We we okay. have have van will travel. That's our motto. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know this would be a And yeah, the Federal Trade Commission can all, some, we can send somebody out from the Northwest region as well. Yeah, I think that okay. with the Consumer Protection Washington group, you you've got all of those organizations that are willing to go out and do presentations on a variety of topics. So. Yeah. And part of the uh, just reporting to law enforcement is that we also have the ability, if, if there's ongoing bleeding, is to, to stop the bleeding, at least while we do an investigation, so we can help um, stop 
close accounts or stop so that no more money can come out while we do an investigation. And sometimes that's very helpful and at least protecting the resources that are left with the elder that's already lost a lot of money. So I, it just, um, I, 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 we have an aging population and it's huge and it's going to continue growing and I think we need to be, we need more eyes on the problem and eyes out there and uh, it's a fine line between, you know, being nosy, you know, trying to get in someone else's business but, you know, maybe as a community, as a society, we, it's something we do need to do and try to figure out a way to do it respectfully and, you know, ethically, but also being able to protect those that are less vulnerable. Um, or vulnerable. And one thing that I've uh, researched over the last couple years is that often as you grow older, the first part of your uh, brain that starts going, going a little bit is your frontal lobe, which is the part of your brain that makes financial decisions. So oftentimes people don't even exhibit any signs of dementia, but really smart people start making really poor financial decisions. And so you guys might be one of the first people that actually start seeing this, if they're, especially if they're in you know, your library making questionable transactions or asking odd questions about different Yeah, the impulse control like is, yeah. starts to go, and we've had instances of people screaming at bank tellers it's my money, I'll send it where I want it, just give me my money, I know that Mini Cooper in Jamaica is mine. Uh -huh. yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. I just had a comment about how uh, the FTC, Richard McEwen, mm -hmm. um, came into uh, my facility and he gave this really wonderful piece of advice that I now use on a regular basis, which is that uh, his father was contacted by somebody who's like a scam. He said, hey, my son works at uh, the FTC. Um, can I get your name and contact information? I just want to remind him, because I know there's a lot of scams out there, non-judgmentally, and they always hang up on you. Mm -hmm. ah, <laughs> wonderful. Honestly. Yeah, I use the Attorney General's yeah. office. Yeah. On a regular basis, yeah. I use their name in vain all the time. I, it's, I, my, my, here's my script. Thank you very much for calling me. I'm not interested. My number's on the do not call list. If you call me again, I'll report you to the Attorney General's office. I don't get those phone calls anymore. Um, and I tell people, one of, the, one of the handouts in the back talks about developing a refusal script because there's a certain, that generation that's being victimized right now was taught to be polite and always yeah. listen to people. My generation's the one that was like, no, click, hang up. But they feel that they owe somebody. They took the time to call them, so they should have to listen to them. No. Develop a refusal script and hang up. That's very interesting. We just, um, our elder advocate, our civilian elder advocate just retired, but that was one thing, one thing that she always told on her presentations is, you do not need to be polite to these people. And she actually recommended having a whistle, <laughs> like a police whistle, one of those really loud ones, and as soon as you're just blowing it, and she said, no one will ever call you back again. So. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little old school, so. <laughs> well, and what your detective said about you they get re-victimized is because there are lists that are sold between the criminals. So once they get you, they sell your name to everyone else to exactly. go get you. Yeah. So, you know, getting off of those lists is next to impossible. And that's another thing that we're finding also is in the prison system. What works? And it's advertising on Craigslist as a caregiver. You know, there's no background check, you're not working for an agency, you now have full access to somebody that potentially has dementia, or, you know, even if they don't have dementia, they're frail, you know, and um, so that's going down the pipeline, and that's why we see a lot more cases concerning caregivers that were hired off of Craigslist. So, I, I just had a quick question whether, are people getting approached mostly through phone, or is it through email? Sometimes. I'm helping a patron and they have like 10,000 emails. Like you've got there. a ton of stuff. You've got email, you've got direct mail. So there's, I mean, I oh, get stuff get I get stuff in the mail at home all the time. <laughs> Luckily, I take, you know, when it's the, we finance your home, I walk it upstairs to the third floor, hand it off to them. I don't get those emails anymore. Um, but it's, yeah, it's coming in all directions. Um, and now that we've taught our seniors to use cell phones and they're not having the landlines, now it's coming in on the cell phones as well. And so trying to teach people not to pick up the phone for numbers that they don't recognize and let it go to voicemail, that's another difficult thing, especially if they're lonely. We, we actually track this kind of information in our, uh, our, in our com complaint database. And for older adults, it's mostly by phone. But that's, it's not clear whether that's because older adults still have landlines or telephones or answer calls. Um, so we do see a lot of fraud against older adults still being, uh, help being 
uh, conducted over the phone, at least initially. But for younger people, it's text message, it's email, it's spam, it's websites. Um, yeah, the student loan stuff is coming via email. email. So. Yes? I don't know if my parents are being bombarded with phone calls from charities that are real. These are the charities that I've broken into in the past for organization. But clearly, they're targeting my parents because they, they get multiple calls every single day and they won't take no for an answer. We taught my mom how to say no. We haven't taught her how to say no. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just speak a little bit to that. Um, when, when I was at the Attorney General's office, I did charitable solicitation regulation, and the Federal Trade Commission doesn't do quite as much of that, but um, most charities, even legitimate charities, will use commercial fundraisers, um, and they have to be registered with the state. And most commercial fundraisers will take the vast majority of the donations that they receive. So uh, some commercial fundraisers will take up to 85 to 90 percent of the donation that you give to them. Um, they're supposed to identify themselves as calling from a, as a commercial fundraiser on behalf of a charity. Um, so they should say, you know, I'm calling from donor relations on behalf of American Red Cross. But if you go to the Secretary of State's website, you can look up on um, public information um, which charities use which commercial fundraisers and exactly how much of your money is going to the commercial fundraiser versus the charity. And people are shocked to find out how much of their money is actually going to commercial fundraisers. Um, and even the people, I, I don't see them quite so often, but the folks that are, have clipboards and are downtown asking for you know, Save the Children donations, those are all commercial fundraisers. They're probably taking the majority of your donation. So the advice that I always give to people about um, charities is, you know, invest. Look up the charity first if you've never heard from heard about them, because there are just sham charities out there. And then if somebody calls you or stops you on the street, um, and you want to give to that charity, it's better to give directly to the charity if you don't want your money going to the commercial fundraiser. But again, go to the Washington State Secretary of State's website. A huge amount of public information about charities commercial fundraisers is all made publicly available and this now is they refer off to um, the Better Business Bureau's website uh, donate.org is the other one that you can check um, and it, the sad thing about the charity calls is that they are not covered by the do not call list but except for one of one caveat to that is that if somebody does call and they want to be placed on an entity specific do not call list if, if your parent gets called by, say, you know, somebody on behalf of Save the Children and they no longer want to receive those calls, they can say, put me on your list, and then that charity can't call them for a year. I mean, it's cold comfort because they're going to get a call from some other charity because, like what people were saying, these lists get sold and uh, transmitted. Um, but you can request from a charity to be placed on an entity-specific do not call list, and uh, the charities have to abide by that for one year. I just, and this may be more of the memory workers itself, because one of the issues is um, patron privacy and not giving up information and, and to what level we can go to. And I don't know if we even have an actual policy or procedure within our library. I, I've got one particular patron that he's been scammed ever since I've been here for five years with send us this fee, you've won this lottery, and he's done Ireland and France and Britain, and it keeps going on, and we've tried to talk to him. He says, no, 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 I know it's going to work. And it's frustrating to, to see this, but we've been told we can't do anything because it's his privacy, it's his choice to do this, and I feel like it's just caught in a, in a quagmire and, and frustrated with that process. I, I, I don't have any answers for that except um, you can make anonymous calls to the Adult Protective Services if you know his name. Yeah, and then we'll get it <laughs> if it's Seattle and try to contact him and just, you know see if there's anything we can do. Maybe work with the. Are you Seattle? Seattle. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know I, I don't know, maybe be able to develop some sort of relationship with him. I mean I'm sure you're busy and have other things to do as well, but um, and. Uh, yeah, that's a hard I, one. I try and maintain the connection with them. Sure. We try and keep communication lines open. We try and not be as helpful. Yeah. Uh, and all the scanning and all the emails and stuff going back and forth yeah. to try and break that connection. Have yeah. you tried providing him information about the various scams that are out yeah. there? Okay. Yeah, those are very frustrating. And some of those people, because even with us, we've dealt with those uh, 
and that, that have been victimized and actual have family that's involved in trying you know change their accounts, change their phone number, and do all this stuff. But they sometimes are the most stubborn people and really truly believe, you know, because this part of their brain is you know started to shut down and truly truly believe that they're they're going to win the big one. So I think there was someone else. No, what, people, do they ask you to say yes? Yes, or they call up and they know your name, and the minute that they have your voice recorded, you're sunk. Um, I, we've had, um, I think in the last six months or so, it's been on various um, uh, news information, and we've, we've had maybe three situations of people calling the library, saying something about now, they ask me my name and so forth, and we try to say in the business science department, if you don't recognize the caller ID on your phone, the area code or the phone number, please don't answer the phone and please don't say hello, please don't say yes, please don't say your name. But I wonder if you're getting reports of that because that appears to be just networking and branching out all over the place the minute that your voice is recorded. I, I don't know anything about that personally, but after the session, let me get your contact information and I can go back and get some information from you and that, to share with you that you can share with your coworkers. But I will just say something that everybody does now is spoofing phone numbers. So you'll get, and we see this all the time is that telemarketers will get phone numbers that will show up with a local area code, mm -hmm. particularly for charities because they want people to believe that they're calling from the local community. So they'll you know call up and be like, hey, it's just, you know, firefighters in your area are raising money um, and the, the area code will show up as the same area code or they'll have uh, PO boxes in the same city or the same state as where they're uh, telemarketing or soliciting. So you don't even want people to necessarily think that if it's a local area code, they should answer the phone. It's you know whether you recognize the number or not. So I wrote the information desk at the public library, and uh, we're not supposed to do that. Uh, we're not supposed to do legal advice, but we do get patients frequently who are looking at scams, and I'm just wondering if anybody has a diplomatic way to suggest to somebody that this is not a legitimate enterprise to someone who hasn't asked for information, maybe even someone from the staff. I think you just said it. This, this doesn't sound right. I think you may have stumbled on a scam. I would really think um, twice before moving forward. Here's some resources on this website where we can check to see if this individual is licensed and, registered and the product is registered. If that looks good, maybe you want to talk this over with somebody, uh, your financial advisor, before you um, invest. But but just, you know, this is funny, it's raising some red flags for me based on my experience and things like that. Let's slow down and talk about it a little bit and make sure that this is legit. And, and I think really kind of putting it into, you know, let's do some research or you can do some research and here is how you can do the research and here's the website here's a pamphlet so then it's not saying you know that they're old and can't make decisions for themselves anymore but you're giving them the tools to make the better decision and hopefully it's hard yeah if you put it in the mind. context of saying I know there's a lot of scams out there um, really want to make sure you're being safe and you're not being victimized um, so that it's not saying you're making bad decisions, but it's on the people coming after them, and then maybe even just showing them, here's, here's some places where you can go look. And one thing that I like to share with people is that I worked at the Attorney General's office for nine years before I joined the Federal Trade Commission, and the day before, literally the day before I started the Federal Trade Commission, I fell for a scam. Um, and so it was a sticker, it was a fake, like, second delivery notice on my door that said like, oh, we tried to drop off your package, just call us and we'll arrange for a, another delivery. So I call and it's actually, a, a, they're trying to list generate. So now they've got my phone number, they've got my address, and now I'm gonna show up on these phone numbers. And I, you know, I should have flipped it over, read the fine print, and I didn't because I was really excited about my package. <laughs> and, uh, it happens to everybody. So sometimes it's really good to remember that scammers, there's no end to the amount of inventive 
and creative thought that will go into coming up with new ways to take people's money. And we are all very susceptible to it. So it's not, oh, look at that dumb person that wired $200,000 to Nigeria again. Yeah. It's, it's everybody. No, they, they're very specific in how they target people. They've studied, they, you know, whether or not they've studied actual psychology classes or not, they know what works. And they've worked together to, to really target and pinpoint what works, what's the demographic, what, what language do you use, how loud do you speak to them, you know, how do you speak to people. There's a certain demographic that if you yell at them, they will do anything to make you go away. You know, um, like when grandparents scam is a one that we've run across and you know it's it's the normal con that anyone can really fall for that you know they call and say hey this is you know or you know I'm in jail grandma help me help me you know whatever and then the grandma says hey Johnny is that you Johnny and, and now yeah. we have, you know and it's you know this uh, you know yeah, and now yeah. they have the name, and you know, there's We've been working with our senior center yeah. folks to say, you know, well, which grandchild is this? I have 12. <laughs> you know, um, so that they'll start to know. So if they don't have the phone number, if they don't have the name, if they don't have the right, you know, because they can come in on Facebook, too. That's the other thing. We've got all our grandparents on Facebook now because we want them to be connected with the kids. There's so many different ways that they're coming in. It's a matter of talking to our seniors and, and giving them the tools of how to step aside that. I mean, at, you were talking about the phone call with recording the, the phrase, yes. I got one at work. I work for a state agency. <laughs> I had him online for 10 minutes. Nice. Because I just was like, okay, we're going to work this one. <laughs> and he just kept working and working and working and finally he just gave up. He was like, fine. Because he asked me like 8,000 different kinds of questions. You could say that is correct. I am at that address. <laughs> Those kinds of things, but never say yes. I mean, there's a million different ways that you can teach people how to, how to do it, how to protect themselves. I, most of the seniors I talk to now, they turn it into a game. How can I turn this around on them? Mm -hmm. At least it gives them to do fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, just real briefly, I'll just throw this out here. Also, we uh, have had a couple of cases where like dating websites, you know, older gentlemen in the 70s were, Sweet well, swimmers. yeah, and well, the, the female half of it will, on her profile, will specifically target 70 and over. You know, she's in her 40s, but she's targeting a, a partner in his 70s. And so uh, those are all, uh, for us, as far as criminal um, investigations are difficult because often the 70-year-old man is just lonely and <coughs> wants this contact with this woman, you know, who is now getting cars and money and, you know, whatever. But, yeah, so there's, you know, other things to be looking out for. And the soundest part on that is that they will bleed them dry. Yeah. They'll bleed them dry and then move on to the next one. And there's virtually... You know, that's what I'm saying. I don't know why anyone commits robbery anymore. Because that, that, I mean, that's going to be virtually impossible to prosecute, especially if the person doesn't have dementia. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.